some of us uh, follow a particular online blog. Mennonites, I think, are good at writing online blogs because they can sort of express themselves freely um, and pretend that no one really knows who they are. <laughs> but we do, actually. So uh, a recent online blogger wrote an article called The Quilt Maker's Guilt. And she said, I'm using her words here, she said, quilts, we like to think, are as Mennonite as rhubarb plots. And maybe they are, except that the plots-making Mennonites are the kind who came through Russia, and the quilt-making ones are the kind that came through Pennsylvania. And lots of people with no connection whatsoever to Mennonites also make quilts and eat rhubarb desserts, too. <laughs> I won't go on to say what else she said about making quilts. But who better to help us figure out what makes a Mennonite or an Amish quilt than Dr. Yannickan Smucker. So I'm pleased to welcome and introduce Dr. Smucker to you. She is here from Westchester University in Pennsylvania, which is not far from Philadelphia where she lives. At Westchester University, she is a professor of digital and public history and American material culture. Her book, Amish Quilts, Crafting an American Icon, published in 2013 and featured in the New York Times gift list for that year, is, its, is in itself beautifully crafted, visually and intellectually. Yannicka's questions go beyond what differentiates the log cabin versus the wedding ring quilt to explore the cultural and consumer meanings of Mennonite and Amish quilts. Well, you can read much more about Dr. Smucker in the program that you have. <coughs> I certainly encourage you to return tomorrow night to hear her second talk here in the Great Hall which brings in a fascinating, fascinating comparison with Hmong textiles. Tonight we will hear her talk about abstract art or country craft, the quilts of the Amish. Welcome, Dr. Smucker. Thank you so much, uh, Marlene, and thank you so much to uh, the entire Grable community for such a warm welcome and inviting me here. It's been a real pleasure so far, and I'm looking forward to spending the evening with you tonight, and hopefully I'll see some of you again uh, tomorrow night. Um, excuse me while I float back and forth just a little bit here between the, um, the computer uh, to advance. The, is the light okay here? Does it need to be done? Is everyone see okay? Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself first. Um, I began making quilts when I was a teenager. Um, I was the kind of kid I learned how to sew fairly when I was a fairly young age. I grew up in Goshen, Indiana, um, in a Mennonite home. And um, I was the kind of kid who always liked to have a project to work on. And so when I was about 16, I, I decided I was going to make a quilt. My grandmother was a prolific quilt maker. Um, her mother was even more prolific. Her mother um, in Eastern Ohio um, was a professional quilt marker. That's the person who draws the actual design on a quilt top um, so that other people know where to stitch. And uh, she's also very involved in the um, sewing circle at uh, First Mennonite Church in Sugar Creek, Ohio, where they uh, raised tons of money for um, church programs and for missions through the, through the quilting. Um, but I never knew her. I never knew Mary Beachy, but I knew um, my grandmother, um, who you see here. And um, so I learned how to quilt this summer um, when I was a teenager. And I loved the whole process from picking out all the fabrics at the fabric shop, choosing the patterns. I had pulled this book off my mother's shelf. My mother had made one quilt at that point called How to Make a Sampler Quilt. And some of you might be familiar with this process. A sampler is a quilt where each block is different. And so I got to choose my, I don't know, 20 favorite blocks from this, this book. And, figure out the patterns and, and choose the fabrics, and I was hooked. I absolutely loved the process. Uh, and it was a couple of summers later when uh, we got together here and set up the quilting frame around the dining, in the dining room of my home. This is my great-grandmother's quilting frame, and here I hand-quilted 
um, the quilt with my mother and my grandmother. And also, I, uh, you can see me here with my uh, grandmother a few years later. Um, but in the meantime, I went to Goshen College and I studied history and women's studies and I kept making quilts. Even brought a quilt frame into my college house, set it up in the dining room there, and invited, invited my friends over to help quilt. Um, then, like many a persnickety quilt maker before me, when they would leave, I would take out their stitches. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I really loved um, making quilts, and as I studied history and women's studies, I never really understood that quilts actually fit in with that. And it wasn't until a few years later when I decided to go back to school to uh, start my graduate education that I realized I could study quilts as my academic pursuit. And so I began to fit these pieces together in my life. And my very first um, academic paper I wrote about quilts, although I, I did, I wrote a review of a quilt exhibit for the Goshen College Record at one point when I was in college still. So. But my first true um, scholarly paper on quilts was based on an interview with my own grandmother about um, her first quilt, which she made in the 1920s when she was uh, a late teenager. And it was very much uh, the convention that that's what a woman of her age does. And um, she, this is the quilt you see here. It's, um, it was an embroidered, had embroidered blocks that she bought from, I think, like a, a drugstore or a mail order catalog that were, uh, had, they were printed exactly where she should do the embroidery. Um, and that was, that was her first quilt, which I am just now lucky enough to have in, in my own uh, very small quilt collection. So I kept studying quilts, and I, I did so at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, which is home to the world's largest publicly held collection of quilts at the International Quilt Study Center and Museum, where you can actually get a degree in, in quilt history. And, and that's what I did for my master's degree. And I worked as the curatorial assistant, and I became sort of a connoisseur of Amish quilts in particular. They had just acquired a collection of Amish quilts at that time, and they started calling it um, Yannickin's uh, thesis before I had even arrived, because they knew I had a background uh, as a Mennonite and was interested in, in Anabaptist culture. And so this was a perfect project for me. And I began to learn all the patterns, I could identify uh, the fiber weaves, I could identify the, um, well, the fabric weaves and the fibers I could identify using a microscope and I became a real, uh, real expert in how to distinguish um, quilts from one another, the regional differences, the patterns, and so forth. But then I also began to ask some more complicated questions like, why do we keep these quilts folded up in acid-free tissue paper in the state-of-the-art storage facility instead of using them on beds? Um, I grew up using quilts on beds. Why are they worth so much money? I also had access to the donor files. I could see just what they've been appraised for. What had happened um, between these quilts? I grew up you know, near an Amish community from them being just a standard thing in an Amish home to being these works of art hung on walls in a museum and a gallery. So I started to explore the, that question and, and several other similar related research questions about why we value um, the objects the way we do and how their value changes based on who we are, whether we're someone who grew up in a Mennonite family or an Amish family or whether we're an art uh, enthusiast or an art critic um, or a museum curator. And, and that's what I began to study as I pursued my PhD in history, um, really exploring this cultural history of Amish quilts in particular. So that's a little bit about me. I also want to hear a little bit about you um, this evening. So how many of you here tonight make quilts? Oh, I am so pleased to see so many quilts here tonight. <laughs> And how about own quilts? By even more, this is a good crowd, all right? Uh, do you use your quilts? <laughs> These are a couple very common uses from my home. And how about give away quilts? Quilters are very generous people, of course, yes. Are any of you lucky enough to have received a quilt 
First, the true confession. Do you buy quilts? Yes. Oh, only at the relief sale. Only at the relief sale, right? <laughs> Any of you sell quilts? Even a few hands here, too. Have any of you exhibited quilts? I know some of you have, because you're responsible for the beautiful exhibit I see uh, out in the M atrium. So there are a couple really dramatic quilt exhibits from recent years. You see on the left, the, um, the um, AIDS Memorial quilt on the National Mall in Washington, DC, where each, each panel represents someone who has uh, died of AIDS. And there was another very dramatic exhibit in New York City a few years ago called the Red and White Exhibit held in this old armory building where each quilt was suspended from the ceiling and a uh, spotlit and, uh, and each, each quilt of, um, I believe, a thousand quilts, they were all uh, red and white. So it, the power was in the number of the quilts rather than in each individual quilt. But not all exhibits are this dramatic um, in order to be enjoyable. Now, do you cherish your quilts? Yes, good, good, good. And now, again, another confessional. How about neglect quilts? Anyone guilty of using their quilts uh, as a picnic blanket or uh, as moving to move furniture or keep it hidden away in an attic? <laughs> um, of course, we all neglect our quilts too. Hopefully, they're not in the shreds that you see here. So. Um, Quilts are really amazing objects because they mean all these different things and you probably have stories related to all of these different subjects that we've just touched on. Um, and I think quilts are fantastic to, to think about because we say we make them because they're utilitarian, they keep us warm, but if you just wanted to keep warm, you could figure out a different way to do that, right? You could, you could go down to a department store and buy a, a cheap comforter, a cheap blanket. So there's something much more powerful to them. We, we cut fabric up simply in order to sew it back together. <laughs> um, it's not a normal thing, right? Um, so I, I'm really interested in exploring why we do this and why quilts resonate with us so much. Um, within our Anabaptist, Mennonite, Amish culture, um, we're often asked, well, I'm often asked, well, what, what makes an Amish quilt Amish? Or what makes a Mennonite quilt Mennonite? And here is my really solid expert piece of advice. The, the best way to tell is to ask the maker what church she goes to. <laughs> <laughs> Same holds for Methodists as well, if you, if you need to know. Um, so this is especially true. You in this room, of course, know that there's this whole <coughs> spectrum of Anabaptist cultures and traditions. So, one Mennonite quilt made by one type of Mennonite on the, on the spectrum is a much different Mennonite quilt than another Mennonite quilt. And the same goes for Amish across North America as well, that there is such a wide variety of Amish that it's too challenging, it's too difficult to pigeonhole um, a certain uh, type of Amish quilt as standing in for all Amish quilts. There's quite a variety as well, depending on where you're from, when you made the quilt, uh, what purpose you made the quilt for as well. Um, so we're going to kind of explore this idea of what makes an Amish quilt, uh, what makes a Mennonite quilt, um, is there anything particular, sort of learn some of the hallmarks and sort of uh, learn some of the surprises about Amish quilts as well. So we're going to play a game tonight called <laughs> Is it an Amish quilt? Oh. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start off with some easy ones. <coughs> so which of these two quilts is the Amish quilt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the left. Okay, very good. This is a good crowd. Right, so uh, let's check it out. That's correct. The one on the left is correct. <laughs> yeah. So on the left we have a center diamond um, from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, which the quilts from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania are the ones that first attracted um, outsiders to Amish quilts. Lancaster is in fairly close proximity to New York City and to Philadelphia, and so these urbanites in the late 60s and into the early 70s, when they're out tooling around in the countryside, began to notice these quilts, 
and thought, wow, that looks just like the abstract paintings that are being shown in galleries in New York City. Uh, I want to hang one of these on my wall. In, in fact, it's a lot cheaper than a painting uh, sold in a New York City gallery. And so the real attraction to these Lancaster County quilts was initially just purely graphic. They, they looked great hanging on a wall. I don't know who the Amish are who made this, um, but that's really striking. On the right is a much more uh, common quilt of the mid-19th century, a red and green quilt. It's in the pattern often called New York Beauty, um, attributed to Missouri. So next, uh, which is the Amish quilt? On the right, let's see. Why do you say so? Solid color fabrics. Solid color fabrics. All right, let's take a look. Very good. All right. Um, so these both, I mean, they share a lot in common. They're both made with small squares of fabric. Um, but indeed, the one on the right uh, is of uh, predominantly solid colored fabrics, which um, historically was true of most Amish quilts um, earlier in the 20th century, in large part because they used the same uh, fabrics to make quilts as they used in their dress. And if you're familiar with the Old Order Amish in particular, they generally used solid colors. Um, that was actually dictated by their ordnung, the guidelines for um, all sorts of lifestyle issues within Amish communities. Um, the one on uh, the split nine patch is also from southeastern Pennsylvania, probably made in communities very close to where the Amish lived, probably by a Pennsylvania German quilt maker but did not have uh, any of the restrictions against using, as you see here, lots of plaids and stripes. Um, the one on the right is from Holmes County, Ohio, in the Amish community. So next we have two basket quotes, all in solid colors. The right is the Amish one? <laughs> good effort, good effort. I know you, there was a divided crowd here. Um, it is, in fact, uh, the one on the left, which is a, uh, a small crib quilt from Topeka, Indiana, made around 1920, which is now in the Indiana State Museum collection. The one on the right, also solid colors, um, from around 1910, and this belongs to the International Quilt Studies Center and Museum in Nebraska, where, uh, where I study. And they share a baskets pattern, a little slightly different variation of the baskets, but a lot of patterns were not exclusive to either the Amish and Mennonites or to other, um, other quilt makers outside of the Anabaptist tradition. Patterns were shared. Patterns were published in newspapers, the farm journals, in uh, ladies' magazines. They would often be um, come free with a pack of batting. Batting is the inner layer um, between the front of the quilt and the back of the quilt, and you could get a free pattern. Um, so patterns were in circulation uh, between uh, Amish and Mennonite and the worldly communities as well. So you see a lot of patterns overlap. Right, left? Right. This, of course, is a trick question. These are both, um, these are both Amish quilts. <laughs> They're both diamonds. They're both center diamonds. And you can see here how a quilt, make, a quilt pattern can evolve over time. The one on the right is, um, is earlier. It's from probably around 1930. And this is sort of that classic center diamond. We saw one of these earlier. The, the center diamonds that had red centers were particularly appealing to the collectors and art enthusiasts in the 1970s. Um, but by the 1950s, when this one was made in 1954, um, Lancaster Amish quilters had sort of adapted um, this central diamond motif and began to give it a little more flair. We, he, we see um, embroidered flowers on the outside, a very decorative uh, prairie points border. They call these ribbon quilts because it looks like there's a ribbon weaving in and out to, to form the diamond. And it's a very local Lancaster County tradition, just like the one on the right is, but you can see how a pattern has evolved over time. So here we see two crazy quilts. It's going to get harder, folks. 
<laughs> the, the Amish quilt, in fact, is the one on the right. This is from a, a community right near where I grew up, Honeyville, in uh, northern Indiana, which is hardly even a town. It's really just a crossroads. But um, it's fairly decorative for an Amish quilt. This was made right around um, the turn of the 20th century. Um, in fact, that quilt, the Amish quilt, is dated 1898. Um, crazy quilts, like you see here, were very popular among this late Victorian culture. They, sometimes they were even used you know, as parlor throws. You would see them among uh, non-Amish quilt makers, non-Mennonite quilt makers, in very fancy velvets and satins. Uh, always a lot of decorative embroidery. So this is sort of like the country version of that, sort of a, a more rural, more subdued version, but still has a lot of decorative elements. There's even some oh, embroidered flowers here. Am I still on? You yep. hear me? Um, a handprint. Um, so there, are, depending on what family you grew up in, which church district you belong to, you might get away with some more decorative elements. And it really depended on what the community standards were and what your own individual standards of taste were. Perhaps no one was really going to protest. What are they going to do? Uh, tell you to put the quilt in the chest? That's probably the worst that could happen. Um, the one on the left is a non-Amish quilt made a, right around that same time, about 1910. Also a sort of country crazy quilt, but this one is from New Jersey. Here's a couple more crazy quilts. Do either of them feel Amish? Do they look Amish? The one on the right. Let's see. Sure enough, the one on the right um, is from Arthur, Illinois. And I truly think these women from Arthur, Illinois, I don't know what they were into, but they're quilts. <laughs> it's like they were competing to see who could make the most outlandish, craziest designs. Um, there's a wonderful book written about the Illinois Amish quilts, and you can see that it includes a lot of genealogy that connects the women, and you can see that cousins, aunts, nieces were basically trying to make the, the most outlandish, outlandish in that they weren't using uh, traditional patterns. They were very scrap-oriented quilts. Um, but then they, they have a great appeal to collectors um, as well because they truly are um, very modernist works of art, um, you might say. This is another uh, crazy quilt. Um, this one is from Pennsylvania from around 1930, uh, non-Amish quilt. So here, two applique quilts. What do we have? The left, left, left. Very good. So some people would say, well, neither of these could be Amish because it's applique, and the Amish tend to not use applique. Applique is the process of stitching fabric on top of a background fabric rather than piecing two edges of fabric together. And, but we have very good documentation on this quilt. There's an oral history associated with it. We know the Amish family um, that it came from. And her mother was, um, the mother of the woman who made this was a little bit more progressive. Didn't mind trying out new things. And this is probably how quilt making itself emerged within the Amish community. Um, neither Amish nor Mennonites made quilts in Europe before they came to North America. It was a tradition that they learned in North America, in communities in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and probably here in Ontario as well. And they'd learn it from their neighbors. Those neighbors might have been other German-speaking people. They might have been English, sometimes perhaps Welsh, Quaker, um, but the German-speaking populations from the Anabaptist tradition did not bring quilt making with them. It was a learned tradition. And as quilt makers, I think, have a history of being quite adaptive, and that is what we see here in the left in this Amish quilt. Um, it's still a very Amish-style setting with these corner blocks, the wide borders, yet this woman was willing to try a, an applique pattern that may have been popular among some of her Pennsylvania Dutch neighbors. <laughs>
The one on the right is a, it's an eagle's quilt, um, probably from about 1890 also. It's a very Pennsylvania um, pattern. So here are two more applique quilts. Right? Interestingly, these are both Amish quilts, believe it or not. So some Amish quilts show us that there are no rules for what makes an Amish quilt. Um, the one on the right is a tulips applique quilt by Lizzie Hostetler Harshberger of Napanee, Indiana in 1932. A similar kind of account here, she had a fairly progressive mother who allowed her to choose whatever colors, whatever patterns she liked. And she was very skilled at applique, very, very neat stitches here. And she was quite a prolific quilt maker. Several of her quilts are now in the Indiana State Museum in, in Indianapolis. The one on the left has a really fabulous story. It's a signature quilt. Some, you might call it a friendship quilt. Um, you can kind of make out the stitches here for uh, the names. So I um, got the file on this quilt a few years ago and began to try to figure out who these uh, women all were. And it was, there was a, some geographic attribution to Pinecraft, Florida. So Pinecraft, Florida is where many Amish and Mennonites across the whole spectrum from the most progressive, my, uh, one of my best friend's parents, uh, go down there every summer, uh, or every winter, who would go there in the summer, it's, it's for the snowbirds, um, to very old order Amish um, go in buses. Um, dozens and dozens of buses bring the Amish down to Florida every year, every winter. And they've been going to Florida since the 1940s, um, when there were tracts of land um, that were a former military base, were parceled out and many were bought by Amish and Mennonite families. So it's this little, it's right outside of Sarasota, it's this little um, strange enclave where all of this whole range of Amish and Mennonites all interact. They play volleyball together, they go to the beach together, they ride these big tricycles together. Um, and there's no distinction between which kind of Amish you are, which kind of Mennonite you are, you're all interacting in this sort of whatever happens in Pinecraft stays in Pinecraft sort of mentality. Um, but in the 1940s, they were already going there. And so the, the names on here, I was able to, to take all the names and look in the genealogies. And based on who had used their maiden name and who had used their married name, I could narrow it down to this, uh, this small window of the, in the late 1940s when this quilt was made. And this, I wish I had a better detailed photo of this. Um, many of them signed what community they were from, and they ranged from Virginia, Nebraska, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, uh, all across um, Mennonite and Amish communities in North America. And so these were friends, young women. Sometimes they also signed their husband's name in the stitches as well if they were married, who met in Pinecraft, Florida while vacationing, and they commemorated their friendship with this quilt. The names were Yoder, Raber, Chuck, Weaver, Troyer, Schmucker, Schlabach. So, the real deal. <laughs> so here, uh, two embroidered quilts. Are either of these Amish? You see Napanee, yeah, good eye, Troy. Uh, he sees Napanee, it's a dead giveaway. That's correct. The one on the left is, um, is indeed Amish. Um, it has also names throughout from Midwestern communities. Um, uh, these were all cousins and friends. It's dated 1956. And it is actually in the collection of the um, Heritage Historical Library in Almer. Um, uh, the woman, woman's family ended up in Canada, Martha Helmuth's family, and she donated it to the collection there. But it shares a lot of similarities with the quilt on the right, um, because friendship quilts of this pattern, or this style, these embroidered blocks, were a, a fad throughout communities, no matter what religious affiliation you had, throughout the 30s and 40s and 50s. They could buy uh, die stamp designs that had for your embroidery, um, and you could stitch your name, uh, show off your stitches, 
um, and then share with one another to commemorate friendships and relationships. Um, I was just talking this morning after seeing the um, conscientious objector exhibit um, that there are some quilts similar like similar friendship quilts that commemorated uh, the men and their wives who worked together on alternative service. And I know of a couple of those um, from the United States. And so you, again, see this spectrum of Amish and Mennonite, probably some Quakers, um, at least in the States, who built their friendships um, on this alternative service and they remembered those relationships through a quilt. So here we have two for the cheery, pieced quilts, sort of Easter egg colors, are either of these Amish. Right? Right? Why do you say so? Just, just, just a feeling. <laughs> the one on the right indeed is, but so is the one on the left. These are both Amish quilts. So I wasn't sure if you'd say, well, there I can see some polka dots here that can't be Amish. Um, but the case for this quilt on the left is that um, the woman, who was Amish, received a bag of scrap fabrics from her non-Amish friend that had all kinds of prints. And there was no real prohibition against using those, at least in her community, uh, in Ohio, I believe, is where um, she was making this quilt. Yeah, it's Ohio Amish quilt maker. So she integrated this great variety of scraps, put them in a very playful pattern. The one on the right is from a, a newer Amish community, one from Guthrie, Kentucky. Um, as you might know, the Amish have expanded greatly throughout the second half of the 20th century in particular. Um, they have, uh, I wish I could remember a good statistic of exactly how many new communities have been founded. But the population keeps doubling um, about every 20 years. Um, it's growing leaps and bounds, and lots of small communities like the one in Guthrie have been founded. So here, which one's Amish? Left, right. I again, I've put two Amish quilts on the screen again. Um, you're gonna figure figure me out soon. Um, both of these are Amish quilts, and you might say, well, they can't be there. Those two light of colors. So what happened when these artists and collectors began to? Um, seek out Amish quilts in the 1960s and 70s and into the 80s is they ignored the quilts that didn't have the dark colors, that didn't look the way they thought an Amish quilt would. And many of these lighter colored quilts, which Amish families call summer spreads or everyday quilts, were left in Amish homes. And so they weren't considered by the curators to be part of this body of work because they didn't fit our preconceived notions of what an Amish quilt should look like. The one on the right is also in the collection in Elmer up here in Ontario. Um, it was made almost entirely from feed sack fabrics. Um, feed sacks um, and other uh, flower sacks often had um, printed or colored cloth or women who um, were very resourceful would dye um, parts of the feed sacks, the colors that they wished to use. Um, on the back of this quilt, I believe you can see some of that printing. And here on the left is a, um, a crib quilt from Middlebury, Indiana, near my hometown, um, from 1925, made by Anna Kaufman Miller. So here, they get weirder. You might not imagine either of these are Amish. Any guesses? Left? Right? 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 It is the one on the right, and not the one on the left. Um, the one on the right is uh, <coughs> was made by Anna Yoder Bontrager in Centerville, Michigan, and she dated it 1921. And the one on the left is actually uh, made by an African American quilt maker from Gee's Bend, Alabama. Um, you may have heard of these Gee's Bend quilts. Gee's Bend was a very isolated enclave in uh, deep south Alabama. It was in the bend of a river that uh, a ferry did not run across the river for many years. And the, the African-American community there, the women, made extraordinary quilts. And they have a very similar sort of story to Amish quilts in that they were, quote, discovered by the art enthusiasts. And 
they became these very sought after sort of status objects and uh, were exhibited in art museums and um, really became worth a lot of money. But you can see it's not that different, the aesthetic of these two quilts. Um, the g Spend community would call this style um, a, a rooftop or housetop quilt. It's not that different from a log cabin kind of style, the way the um, logs circle out. Um, we don't know what the Amish woman called this quilt. Here are two that are fairly similar as well. Right. Right. That's correct. So both of these are sort of of the variety we could call a bars quilt. The one on the right is a Lancaster County bars quilt, and the one on the left is also from G's Bend, Alabama, made in the mid-1970s. I find it really interesting that the G's Bend community calls this pattern a uh, lazy gal. Um, I'm not sure if it's because it's just simple and quote lazy to sew easy straight seams or how the, how the pattern got its name, but um, it's interesting that different communities have different names for the quilts. So here are two more bars quilts. <laughs> how do you tell, right? So these are both, in fact, Mennonite quilts. Um, the one on the left, uh, attributed to Kitchener. Um, this is a local quilt in the International Quilt Study Center and Museum in Nebraska. The one on the right, nearly identical, right, um, is also a Mennonite quilt from Berks County, Pennsylvania. So we know that there was movement between southeastern Pennsylvania and this area of Ontario. I'm not going to at all pretend that I uh, understand the intricacies of the um, immigration patterns to, to Ontario, but um, there are connections, and you can see those connections revealed here in the quilts. So it must be easy to say that all bars quilts must be Mennonite, right? Is that what I just demonstrated? Well, here, just to, of course, complicate things. Neither of these are Amish or Mennonite, but they look nearly identical to the ones you saw on the previous slide. Here on the left is a very early quilt from the, from the early 19th century, estimated date between 1800 and 1820. So that's 100 years earlier than the ones that you saw on the previous slide. Uh, so probably from New Hampshire, so New England quilt. The one on the right, interestingly, is from Wales. There's a Welsh quilt making tradition that bears strong similarity to many Mennonite and Amish quilts. So we better just ask these quilt makers what church they go to, right? Um, because otherwise, we're just going to be guessing. Any guesses? One of these really is Amish. <laughs> Left. That's correct. So these both have a really improvisational feel, like someone was just kind of slicing the pieces to put together. Um, the one on the left is a, an Amish crib quilt made around 1930. And the one on the right is another quilt from G's Bend, uh, Alabama from the 1950s, African-American quilt maker. So this one's quite dark here on the left. I don't know if you can make it out. Um, both are the same pattern called string stars. Which one of these do you believe might be Amish? Right? The one on the right is Amish, and the one on the left is a Mennonite quilt from Waterloo County. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> this also demonstrates that we have this huge spectrum within the Anabaptist communities where perhaps the quilt maker on the left from Waterloo County is actually more conservative than the Amish quilt maker uh, who made a white and pink quilt um, in Ohio or Iowa in the 1950s. So the date, let's see, I'm gonna make sure I've got, yeah, these are pretty contemporaneously, both, both made around 1950. Um, the aesthetic is so different um, because of the color palette. 
Um, yeah, this is the Mennonite quilt from Ontario, and that's the Amish quilt from Iowa. So here again, we see the same pattern in two very different palettes. You're done guessing. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. I've stumped them a few times. One on the right is the Amish quilt. This is from Indiana. There's a really interesting story attached to this quilt. So the woman who made this um, uh, made five quilts in this identical pattern throughout her life. The first one she made in around 1914 when she got married, and then she made three others to give to each of her sisters, and then made this quilt in the early 1960s. This was the last of the five that she made. And um, she lived to be 99 years old, I believe, and uh, a quilt collector in northern Indiana bought the earliest one and the latest one um, off her beds in her home. Um, he was a picker. A picker was the kind of person who would come and knock on the door and say, do you have any quilts for sale? And um, he was lucky enough to buy that one. This is the same pattern, a very, it's kind of this Art Deco fans quilt. Um, this one was made in Nebraska in 1940. So Amish quilt makers did use commercially available patterns. They weren't just inspired by the fields and the fence rows and those sorts of things. Um, they used commercially available patterns too. As you can see, this is the same pattern, um, kind of mere images of each other. But the one on the right has a distinctly Amish setting. Um, and the one on the left uh, resembles the version that was printed in the, um, this was actually from a roll of batting. Mountain mist batting would always uh, have a pattern in each roll. Um, and as a way to encourage women to buy their product. This is the pattern itself, and you can see um, just exactly how the, the first version, or the one on the left, really um, stuck to the pattern pretty closely. So here are two double wedding ring quilts. And the one on the right is, in fact, Amish. Um, it's from 1935 in Ohio. Um, and this is the version that, um, oh, or 1940, I'm sorry, um, in Indiana. I got my, my dates wrong here. Um, the one on the, the left would be a very typical version that was made from a pattern. Um, possibly was even a kit. And we think it's a kit because the gradation of these colors indicates that someone put so much care into designing it that um, even as early as the 20s and 30s and 40s, um, you could buy a kit to make a quilt in which all of the fabric was already cut out for you, and all you had to do was stitch it together. And this is still a common way that some people make quilts. Here, we have two baskets quilts, a pattern you've seen already. And once again, both of these are Amish made. I'm gonna say Amish made here, because the one on the left was designed by a company in Ohio called Amish Design, who were um, a non-Amish couple based in Eastern Ohio, who realized that um, there was demand for the quilts that looked like the really old ones from the early in the 20th century. But those were increasingly expensive, and if you hung them on their, your wall, um, they might fade from the sunlight, and they knew that interior designers and architects wanted to have quilts like this available that were more affordable and you wouldn't risk damage. So this quilt on the left was actually made in the early 1980s to mimic a quilt from the 1930s. and was sold by the company Amish Designs as their promotional materials. I had, and this is the design that the non-Amish woman, Mrs. Susan Delagrange, drafted and gave to her Amish seamstress and said, this is how you create an Amish quilt. Um, these are the colors you should choose. And these Amish women who uh, she employed would complain because she would have them use a thin flannel sheet as the batting, which was not nearly as easy to quilt through as the polyester batting they were using by the 1980s. They would use a uh, pretty thick, um, thick weave muslin for the backing and the women really did not like to quilt through that. Um, but 
They were being paid by this non-Amish woman to create what was a proper Amish quilt uh, to sell <laughs> to the consumers. So here are two, but now the aesthetic has completely changed by the 1980s. These would both be sold in Amish shops, but we don't really know who may have made them. We know, in fact, uh, the one on the right, you can tell it's, it's just a top, it's not actually a completed quilt. And by this point in time, in the 1980s, many of the quilts sold, this, this applique style was very popular in many of the Amish communities among the tourists and the consumers who were coming. Um, but Hmong women, refugees who had resettled in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania and Michigan and Minnesota were employed by many of these Amish shops to do the intricate applique stitching that these popular um, quilts required. So we know that the one on the right, was the applique was in fact done by a Hmong seamstress. And in all likelihood, this one on the left also did because by some estimates, over 90% of the applique work throughout the 80s and 90s was done by Hmong women rather than by Amish women. The quilt making, the quilting itself, the fine stitches that hold the three layers together was probably still done by an Amish woman. That was usually the case. But um, they'd be done for the consumer market through this complex putting out system, a kind of cottage industry. You'd, uh, you'd only do part of the quilt. You wouldn't do necessarily the whole quilt. You specialized. And Hmong women tended to specialize in the applique, and Amish women tended to specialize in the quilting. Here we see nearly identical quilts, slightly different, like reverse color scheme. The one uh, that you see um, in black is an Amish quilt from, let's see, around 1930 from Ohio. And the one on the bed was designed to look nearly identical to it by the company Arch Quilts, who outsourced its, its quilts to factories in China in the late 80s and 90s. So by this point, if you wanted an Amish star from the heirloom collection, you could get it at your department store. And it had nothing to do with who the quilt maker was. Amish really was functioning just as a brand name, as an aesthetic. Um, nothing to do with who made it. This was made in a Chinese factory. If you take a look later, uh, I have a pillowcase um, that the same manufacturer made. Um, looks like an Amish style quilt, but has the label made in China on it still. And these quilts were quite affordable. For less than $200, you could have a king size Amish style quilt. Um, they were machine pieced, just like Amish quilt makers would do. Amish quilt makers also machine pieced, and it's hand quilted, also like Amish quilt makers would do. Not nearly the intricate stitches that you would find typically, but it's, it's decent. Um, it was certainly a cheaper, uh, affordable, I should say, way to have an Amish style quilt on your bed. So the question here is not whether the quilt is Amish, but is she Amish? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no. Um, Land's End, the uh, catalog company, in the late, or the early, I think this was actually 1989, um, commissioned a group of um, Ohio Amish women, as well as some non-Amish women, um, to make a series of about 800 custom, uh, or they were, special edition quilts that they sold from their holiday catalog that year. So if you know a, a thing or two about the Amish, you might know that many Amish uh, refrain from having their photograph taken. So when it came time to do the photo spread um, for the Lands End catalog, um, Susan Yoder, the woman who helped organize the Amish connection, um, she declined to have her photograph taken. So. Uh, they borrowed her clothing and dressed up the, uh, the mother of one of the other women who was involved in the project and got the grandchild to also dress like an Amish woman. And they took their picture for the Land's End catalog so we could have, of course, an authentic looking Amish quilt maker uh, responsible for the quilt. So there's been lots of imitation of the Amish. Um, because of the popularity of Amish quilt making. Neither of these are Amish as well. This one is clearly you know, depicting a lovely pastoral scene um, 
celebrating the Amish, and the one on the right is one of the many, many um, Amish-style quilts that you can buy patterns for, um, you can uh, buy the fabrics to make your own Amish quilt. Can any of, of us in this room make our own Amish quilt? We can make an Amish-style quilt, right? But unless we've gone and joined the Amish church, um, I would argue that we cannot make an Amish quilt. I don't think any of these people are Amish either. <laughs> but by the 1980s, um, this Amish uh, aesthetic was quite popular. Um, the photograph on the right is from an advertisement for the Esprit Clothing Company. Esprit was based in San Francisco. It was a very popular sort of uh, trendy um, sportswear company throughout the 80s. And they were um, home to one of the greatest collections of Amish quilts. They hung uh, Amish quilts throughout their corporate headquarters, throughout the design studios. And probably, I heard anecdotally, and I could never document it for sure, the designers looked to the quilts as inspiration for the clothing line. Um, one of the other things I have up here is what I think is my strongest piece of evidence, um, an Esprit vest I found on eBay. Uh, I also have identified a quilt that I think, a, a quilt I know hung on their walls that, that really resembles this. Um, and you can see just in their, the color palette, these same colors you see on the Lancaster County Amish quilts in particular. And here, another uh, fashion designer clearly appropriating uh, a quilt design in the skirt. So, oh, that's, uh, that's me now. Um, what makes uh, an Amish quilt Amish is, is my last question. Um, and I really don't have a good answer for you. I think that it's a quilt that an Amish family uses. Perhaps they have made it. Maybe they've made it to sell. Maybe it's something they would use in their home. Maybe it isn't. Uh, maybe it's the cheap polyester comforter that they bought at Walmart that they use on their bed. That then is an Amish quilt, right? If it's used in an Amish home, um, it is an Amish object. So um, we've We've used this term, this Amish is really an adjective or a brand name in many senses. Um, the same is true about Mennonite to an extent as well, although Mennonite quilts were, have never been as distinct in our sort of imagination as Amish quilts because there is such a wider array of quilts that Mennonites produce. So I think any of these characteristics could be it. That it's made by an Amish woman, it's used by an Amish family, perhaps even if it's designed by an Amish woman uh, and they didn't even stitch on it, it still perhaps is Amish. So the last thing I'd like to do tonight, um, each, of, each table I believe has a, what we historians call a primary source um, on their table. Did, did you guys get one as well? Or did you, can you, let's see. Um, you share your uh, smoker ad with a, I realized once I had passed them all out that I may have neglected your table. So, Primary sources are the documents that historians use uh, to interpret the past, to figure out what happened in the past. And these are just an array of some of the sources that I have used to do my, uh, my research on this project, particularly as it relates to the, the consumer culture of quilts. So I'd like to um, figure out what you all have, if you can identify them, and we'll see if we can sort of date them as well. that's here on the screen. Um, which group has this? All right, it's a, from 1949, from a classic book about how to make quilts called The Standard Book of Quilt Making and Collecting. It's, my grandmother had a copy of it, and that's how I own a copy of it. Um, and in this book, we have a pattern for the Pennsylvania Dutch quilt. 
No one would have used the phrase Amish quilt at this point in time. Amish quilt was not something people said until probably 1971, I think is the first instance that it was ever in print. So this was, a, but, but people knew who the Pennsylvania Dutch were because people had been visiting Pennsylvania Dutch company, or country since, uh, since the interstates were built in the 1940s, um, which you see here. So this is sort of one of our earliest instances of trying to sell the idea of, of Amish quilts, although here it, it is, of course, called Pennsylvania Dutch and looks nothing like an Amish quilt, but it has the sort of fracture elements um, that you might be familiar with. So what do we think is next in our chronology? Anyone have anything that might be from the 50s? What, what do you have? We have an ad. But you I have an ad? Okay. Buy, we, think it's, we think it might be later. Later, maybe? Okay. <laughs> I know, you didn't know there'd be a quiz. I mean. The next one in our chronology, someone have this one? Did this one not even get, maybe if this one didn't even get printed. Well, this is um, from around 1965 when um, Amish tourism is really heating up. And we have things like the Amish musical and the sort of old fashioned Dutchy uh, way of saying things. This is a place map from uh, a tourist attraction called Dutch Haven. Again. We don't see any quilts. Quilts aren't on anybody's radar. And here, we're jumping a little bit ahead. Is this your table? Okay. So this, I, I showed you the company um, Amish Design who employed um, Amish women in Eastern Ohio to make quilts. So we have their sort of a um, paid advertisement at the top, but um, we have, hello, this is to let you know we don't expect to get your quilt done by Wednesday as Menno's brother Daniel's barn and shed burn down. So we'll be going over there part-time to help, but hope to have it done by the next Wednesday then. Sincerely, Mrs. Menno J. Schwarzenjuger. So this is the way this business was run. Um, they would leave postcards with the Amish quilt makers, and then the Amish quilt makers would send them the postcard to let them know when their quilt had been completed. Is that, you're in the back? Okay. So then by the 1980s, this, um, this art market, the collector's market for Amish quilts had really heated up. And uh, do any of you read the Sugar Creek Budget? You know this, this uh, newspaper? This is a newspaper published in Ohio, yet it was it circulated throughout North America, uh, particularly to Amish communities, also to many Mennonite communities. And the, the classified ads are always uh, one of the most entertaining parts of the newspaper. It's, it's famous for the letters that are written by scribes to the budget where they report on what has happened in their community. But um, in the 1980s, there was a very heated ad war among quilt dealers, people who wanted to buy Amish quilts. And so they would be targeting the Amish readership, trying to convince them uh, to sell their quilts um, that they would pay the highest price. And uh, Eugene Rappaport um, is, and Darwin Beerley are just two of probably dozens of, of quilt dealers who would put their competing ads in the Sugar Creek budget. And it worked. Amish families would then write to them and say, I have a quilt in such, thus and such pattern, and uh, I'm willing to sell it to you. So here is the other half of the Land's End catalog. Um, and you can see the kind of marketing uh, that really was taking place. In order to sell an Amish quilt, you had to convince uh, the consumer that it was made by the light of a kerosene lantern. Uh, this even says that it was delivered, rather than using UPS to deliver it, it was delivered by a horse-drawn carriage. Um, <laughs> you see, we really over oversell this romantic idea of Amish culture when it comes to quilts. Then, um, by 1990, um, there was really, some have called it a quilter's war, a bidding war to employ the best quilt makers. Quilt makers still in, in Amish and Mennonite communities are typically paid by the yard of quilting thread that is used. So you measure out your lengths of thread, and that means uh, the finer the stitching, the more stitching you put into the quilt, the more you're going to get paid um, if you're paid by the yard that you use. 
And conversely, if you use more thread, it's going to take you a lot longer time uh, to finish a quilt as well. But I was able to watch sort of the progression of this price, you know, from the 1970s when uh, quilt makers were getting paid maybe 15 cents a yard up until you get this in the 1990, 45 cents a yard. I think it's still not a whole lot over 50, 50 cents, maybe 55, 60 cents a yard. If you do the math, which I uh, <laughs> was anal enough to do to figure out what kind of hourly wage we were actually talking about, since I'm a quilt maker, I could kind of conceptualize this. It's less than $2 an hour that women are earning um, uh, for their quilting. So think of that next time you, you hire out um, some quilting or bid on a quilt at the relief sale. And um, one final ad, uh, this shows my, my real street cred as a smucker. Uh, but there are Smucker's Quilts is an Amish run store in uh, Lancaster County. And by this point, um, uh, Amish businesses are really learning that they need to sell their Amishness, that they need to sort of perform Amishness as part of, a, of their business, that they need to um, emphasize in their advertisements um, that they have quality Amish products. They also need to accept MasterCard and Visa, of course. Um, there's one woman um, who was known to, when the tour bus was coming up to her quilt shop, she'd get a frame quickly out that she, did, she didn't usually do any of the quilting. She hired other women to do that. But she'd get a quilt, quilt frame out so she could be sitting there when the, the tour bus arrived, because that was all part of the experience. Oh, and I think we do have one, one final ad here. Um, the Pennsylvania Dutch Convention and Visitors Bureau um, understands that quilts are a big part of the attraction, and they use it in their own marketing. They use it um, to convince um, not just quilt enthusiasts, but any kind of tourist to come, that it's part of the authentic experience of visiting Amish country. Well, it's been fun. Thanks for playing along with me tonight. Um, I uh, hope it wasn't too much uh, thinking that I required out of you. Thanks for participating. I know it's getting late in the evening. I'm happy to take some questions if you have some, or we can just also chat um, afterwards. There's a few things. You're welcome to poke around at my little uh, show and tell pieces that I brought with me. Thanks, Yomikin. That was fascinating. <coughs> a wonderful presentation of beautiful images, and I think you've made us all into experts now. I hope so. I hope so. Discerning <laughs> when we see an Amish quilt. Um, the quiz will be tomorrow. So, um, I do hope you all return tomorrow night to hear the second part of the Bechtel Lectures. Maybe you could give us a teaser. Sure, we'd be happy to. Tomorrow will be uh, no quizzes involved, no game show involved. Uh, um, but I will be talking about the relationship, in particular, uh, of Amish and Mennonite um, quilt businesses to Hmong needle workers. Um, so sort of showing how um, the market for Amish quilts developed, and then the integral role that Hmong women played in that marketplace during the 18, 1980s and 90s in particular. But uh, in addition to talking about the Hmong, we'll all be doing some real grounding of the roots of Amish quilt making as well, so you can kind of get the, the big picture. Um, wonderful to help us think about all of these quilts and textiles in new ways, so it will be a wonderful lecture tomorrow night. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out this evening to hear Yannickan and to support Mennonite Studies here at Conrad Grable. Uh, thank you so much. Do come back again if you haven't seen the quilt exhibits that are here uh, in the building. And thank you for uh, really piquing our curiosity for these things that uh, we either neglect or uh, hide away. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Janneke. And please My feel pleasure. free to come and bring your questions forward and to um, look at what is on display here. Thanks so much for coming again.